In 1998, Dina Belzer founded Strategic Economics in Berkeley, California. Since 1998, that firm has expanded its staff, its reach, its scope, its national impact, its effectiveness. I could go on. Dina Belzer's done an extraordinary amount of work over the 30 years of her professional experience on economic issues for urban, rural, and other kinds of communities in this region. Sometimes we call the former Fort Ord sub-rural. Since there really isn't an urban community here in the region, we are much more a community that's sub to our rural neighbor to the north and to the east. Ms. Belzer's skills and abilities range from everything from economic analysis to the fiscal, um, in, uh, fiscal impact and fiscal acuity of individual projects. She's a national leader in developing innovative urban economic research techniques that guide our local policy decisions. And I mentioned that for our local political elected officials because she's also a member of our team that's looking at the regional urban design guidelines. Dina's work always is based on sound market principles, and she works in a way that simultaneously fosters sustainable communities and creating places with lasting value. Dina is also a member of our Regional Urban Design Guidelines consulting team, as I mentioned before, a friend to former Fort Ord Reuse. She's worked for other communities in this region, and a friend of mine, Dina Belzer. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to bring you with me always to make introductions. That was a good one. Um, so I am going to pick up the conversation sort of where we left off to talk about transit. So thank you for your segue. <laughs> uh, and um, I, too, am very excited to be here. I've been working in Monterey County off and on since the early 2000s, and I'm a um, very eager student of this region, if you will. So in my presentation today, I want to cover uh, five substantive topics and then kind of wrap it up with some concluding thoughts. And uh, I'm not going to go through this slide because I want to get through everything. Uh, and I want to uh, give MST credit, by the way, for their connections between bikes and transit. This is a good, actually good segue. So um, first of all, how many of you, by show of hands, are familiar with this concept of smart growth? So a lot of you, good. So I'm not going to talk extensively about this, but I think it's always important to remember that we're talking about a mix of uses, not always mixed use. This is people start to conflate some of these things. We're talking about compact development. Uh, we're talking about choices, making more choices for people. Uh, and we're looking for a process that's predictable and fair, and uh, we're looking for a lot of stakeholder input, which is part what this is about today and part about the charrette in 10 days. Wow, 11 days. That's coming right up. Uh, anyway, uh, I, what I, how about transit-oriented development? How many of you are familiar with this? So not as many as smart growth, but transit-oriented development is really a subset of smart growth. All those concepts that go with smart growth uh, also apply to transit-oriented development, but transit-oriented development is specifically oriented towards transit. Duh, right? Uh, and we're looking at places that are located within a half to a quarter mile of a frequent transit stop or a station. I'll talk about frequency in a minute. This is where this bike and walk part is really important. If I have a transit stop that's near me but I can't get there by walking or by bike, then I might not be as inclined to use the transit. Uh, and uh, finally, transit is really all about connecting up origins, like my house where I start my trip, and destinations. It can be my job, it can be my school, it can be a place where I want to go to eat, uh, but we have to really think of transit as a system, and I think this is where this conversation about bikes and transit start to converge, is how we think about this system. And I'll come back to this. This is really the theme of my talk. Now, what a lot of people think transit is, as Michael said, only sort of an urban system, and it's really all about rail-based systems. Uh, but I would posit that really any kind of uh, transit really works in this equation, and really any kind, almost any kind of development, as long as it's compact. 
and walkable, works with transit. Uh, so uh, we have in a, in a sub, sub-rural region, transit is still a viable concept. I think the relationship between, between transit walking and biking is probably much more tightly linked or something that we have to think about much more carefully in a region like this because a dispersed region, people are much more inclined automatically to drive. So um, this is why I want to kind of tighten up this relationship. Um, now, uh, any transit that supports transit-oriented development has to have three characteristics. One is that it has to be quality. And by quality, I would argue that it has to be frequent uh, at, at least as often as every 15 minutes. So that's not as frequent as when you go to a place like London or Paris and you get down to the metro stop and the train comes every two or three minutes. Uh, but that's a very expensive system and for big, major uh, uh, global cities. This is not a global city, so we have to think of something that is more appropriate to this region, but 15 minutes is still pretty frequent. And the transit needs to be clean and comfortable. You can't, it can't be dirty and messy and kind of yucky, right? So we have to want to ride it. Now, again, as I said earlier, the stops have to be accessible. They can't be across a, a busy arterial road or on the other side of the highway or on the other side of the train track. They have to be close to where people are walking from or to. And again, this connection to employment and other institutions and activity centers is essential. Uh, and in the um, 80s and 90s when we began building, we had a big um, a spate of transit building here in this country in the 70s and then we didn't start again until uh, say in the 80s and we failed to do this connecting up of employment centers to um, uh, to places where people live, and we have some, some of those lines are the poorest performing transit lines in the country, and uh, they're up in Silicon Valley, by the way. So this is very essential. So, uh, and Tim said, you know, well, not all bike trips are uh, commute trips, only, what did you say, 15 or 18 percent, and it's interesting because less than uh, uh, 20 uh, car trips are transit trips. But 60% uh, uh, of all, tr excuse me, less than 20% of total trips are the work trips, but 60% of all transit trips are commuter trips, right? So people are much more likely to use transit to get to work than they are to use it to do the other errands. And the other thing about that commute trip is that it's all made at these peak times. So we're building our transportation infrastructure. Tim had great slides. I'll just speak to his slideshow. He had that uh, horrible, daunting slide of all this freeway uh, clover leaves, right? Uh, and that is a great example of where we're building out our transportation infrastructure for the commute trip. So if we want to build a transportation infrastructure, including uh, roads, uh, that can sort of reduce how much money we're spending on that horrible cloverleaf kind of stuff and can then sp uh, allocate our money across a mul more multimodal expenditure, we have to think about that commute trip. So it's really essential, connecting up employment centers. <laughs> Land use is also uh, essential. We have to have the right mix of uses. And when we talk about transit, we have to really think about what a corridor can look like. So this is the West Line in Denver. It opened up uh, quite recently. And you see the lightest yellow color on this slide are residential, single family home areas. The deep purple are the employment centers. The orange places are places where there's a little more density. So again, you can see that there's a continuum of land use and land use mix. Uh, it's not all a one uh, size fits all, but you can also see how these uses allow or facilitate people to move back and forth. So if I live here in some of these single family neighborhoods, I can now ride the West Corridor either into downtown Denver or I can ride it out here, which is a very large federal center. It's a very big employment center. I think there are five or 6,000 jobs there. So really, when you think about these connections and relationships, again, as part of a system, you can really see how this works. Now, I would also argue that transportation systems, other kinds of transportation systems like transit, and this is really where I'm going to build on Tim's talk, is that walking and, uh, tr and um, biking 
follow the same principle as transportation. And they, uh, if you can do them with uh, high quality, they're easy, they're comfortable, they're safe, you can make frequent trips, and you can connect up to your destinations, then trails, walking paths, bike paths, can begin to serve some of that same kind of connectivity that transit does. And uh, uh, the University of Minnesota, as Tim said, people in Minnesota are crazy about their bikes. They ride bikes year round. They put snow tires on their bikes. I'm not kidding. Okay, they've got little um, nibs in them that grip the ice. Uh, I had some pictures of that, but I took it out of my presentation because it doesn't snow here. But, uh, but what the University of Minnesota found was that people bike to work when the bike trails go, guess where, to their jobs. Okay, so these principles really uh, work to all kinds of transportation. Um, so then, what is the value? Now, I'm gonna start to put some money uh, I'm, I'm the, uh, uh, you know, where, show me the money gal, okay, and I'm going to talk about this. So how does transit create value for people? So the first thing is that location, where you live, and your accessibility to transit has a big impact on how much money you spend for transportation. Uh, and if I'm living in the um, center city, center part of a city, and I'm earning between twenty and uh, thirty-five thousand dollars, so I'm a very low-income person, uh, I can be spending uh, uh, only fifteen percent of my household expenditures on transportation, and my combined cost of housing and transportation against my, uh, as a percent of my total household income is 54%. But for households that are living much further away from employment centers, living away from transit, living away from these alternative uh, transportation choices, are expending what I would call an unreasonable amount of their household incomes on the combined cost of housing and transportation. And this uh, cost is not distributed equitably, so you can see that households earning between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars have the same, you see, you see that same increasing ratio uh, the further you live from employment centers and from center cities, but the impact is smaller on the total household budget. It makes sense. But in a region like this, where you have a significant number of households that have modest incomes, being able to help people save money on the cost of transportation by allowing them to locate someplace where they can use transit or biking or walking as an alternative is another way to boost income for those households and allow people to shift money away from driving and towards other things like healthy food, uh, uh, schools, and other kinds of necessities. The other thing is that proximity to transit increases property values. So this works for the individual homeowner. It works for commercial buildings. This is research that we did, that my company did for BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit District. Uh, but these data uh, can be replicated from all over the country. So what we saw was that for houses that are within a half mile of a transit station, and this is by what we call network. It's not, we didn't just draw a half mile radius and then uh, said as, uh, you know, however you get there. We actually said if you can walk a half mile, so we followed streets and sidewalks and whatever. Uh, so if you're within a half mile of transit, your house is gonna be worth almost 11% more than a house that is between two and five uh, miles away from the transit. So uh, this is a big deal. Uh, and again, in a community where you're trying to uh, allow people to uh, create a better market for housing, having that increased value as a result of proximity to transit can be very beneficial. Now, this is where, again, my uh, numbers overlap with Tim's presentation, because transit biking and walking can save a huge amount on health care costs for individual households. So, for example, people with obesity have 2.3 times higher medical costs than others. So it's about $9,000 a year per household if you have a person in your household with diabetes. And what this graph shows is that um, uh, this line is obesity, and the bars here show the number of people who use transit, biking, and walking as their mode of transportation. So what you can see is, is this, as the bar charts drop, get lower, as the, as the bars get lower, the line on obesity rates goes up. 
So that means that if we have less access to biking, walking, and transit, uh, our household expenditures on health care are going to go up. Now, I also want to talk about seniors. Uh, Tim talked about this a little bit, too, and the fact that um, seniors who use transit are, are uh, less isolated, they're healthier, and they're safer. Um, so what we see, this bar chart here is uh, about the um, rate of occasional transit use. So people who use transit more frequently are staying home less. And what this means is that seniors are less isolated, which is much better for their mental health. Isolation is one of the biggest mental health challenges for seniors. The second challenge for seniors is that they're unsafe drivers. So that's a challenge for the rest of us. So I know we had to take the keys away from my mother a couple of years ago, and she was devastated. And boy, has she become an expert on the bus and train schedule in her community. And she moved to that community explicitly because there was a bus and there was a train. Uh, so she's not as uh, immobile as she would have been if she'd stayed in her uh, house, the house that I grew up in. Uh, but I could tell stories about my mother all day long. I will not bore you with that, but I'm sure many of you can relate to that same thing. The other thing is that for our communities in these tight fiscal times, focus development, and this is again where there's the overlap between smart growth and transit-oriented development, is that smart growth, compact development, really saves money uh, for cities uh, and generates greater revenue per acre. And Peter Katz, I think, may talk about this point later today. If not, he's uh, been behind some of the uh, very great research on this from around the country. But what we say, see is that on a per acre basis, and in California where we think housing is a big fiscal loser, what we see is that compact urban infill multifamily housing actually generates more revenues per acre than a single family house uh, at, that's in a lower density kind of edge location. And so this is actually very significant for our communities. And somebody was asking the question about, well, where do we get the money to uh, provide uh, services to maintain our trails? Well, this is one of the ways we can do that, by doing more compact development that's more fiscally sound and gives us more tax revenue to spend on uh, various kinds of things. So how do we know that transit-oriented development is working around the country? So what we see is that population near transit is growing. So these, these um, uh, big dark green bars are the population growth in, the, in regions that we looked at. And these are organized by the size of the transit systems. Um, and these show the overall population growth. Uh, and these two bars, this is where there's been a new transit system added. And this is where there's an existing transit line. So we didn't want to. Uh, mix apples and oranges here, but we wanted to show. And what we're seeing here is that there's a lot of population growth whoops, uh, in these um, along transit lines, and relative to the amount of land that's being consumed, it's huge. So it's often uh, many more households uh, per acre than what you're getting other places. These are also where we are getting a lot of increase in single person households and uh, almost two thirds of all households in the United States are now one to two people. So uh, we say, well, we don't have enough family housing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's actually not true. We have a lot of family housing in this country. What we don't have is enough small housing uh, for either young households starting out or for, again, uh, baby boomers, empty nesters, retirees, and we've seen a huge amount of growth in these small households. And then some of the bigger households are moving away, so it's kind of a life cycle thing. If I have kids and I want to live in the suburbs, that's great, but if I uh, want to downsize and move to uh, a place that's more transit oriented, then it's what's happening. The other thing is that we're getting more density near transit, absolutely getting more increase in density. Uh, and this is showing the um, uh, units per acre and the, ch uh, the percent change. So this is the increase in the density over time. This is the density per acres. So we're getting, it's all working. We're all getting what we predicted. And then finally, transit stations are also adding jobs. Uh, so, uh, and they're adding jobs in the sectors that we'd really like to see. So we've had uh, faster growth uh, in knowledge-based, uh, which is one of the uh, tech uh, 
industry. This is one of the industries that Monterey County really wants to focus on uh, attracting. And then you've already got the educational and medical here. And these are the kinds of industries that work really well with transit. So if you think about transit as an economic development uh, uh, generator, again, you want to think about what is going to attract various kinds of businesses to want to locate in Monterey County and saying, well, we have a transit system here that can connect people to their jobs. That's a selling point. So what are the uh, emerging lessons that we're learning? Like, how do we distill this all together and understand the kind of things that we need to take into account as we move forward with implementing uh, transit and transit-oriented development and active transportation, which is biking and walking? And the first thing is that demographics are really in our favor. Uh, and I know when you had the symposium here uh, in 2013, 14, so about a year ago, uh, this was something that people talked a lot about, and I want to reinforce this. You have 76 million baby boomers nationally, uh, and many of these people are looking to downsize. Uh, they're driving uh, demand for a new kind of housing product. And guess what? These are the people who are starting to buy houses in the dunes, uh, in, in East Garrison. We've been doing the market work. We'll talk more about this when we're back for the charrette. But to the extent that you are going to have an increasing number of uh, uh, active retirees here, uh, this is going to help drive your demand for this kind of transit, uh, bike, walk-oriented housing. Now the other thing is that the millennials, the kids born uh, uh, between 1980 uh, and about uh, 2000, uh, are also a huge demographic. They're actually bigger than the baby boomers, which is sort of staggering because the baby boomers sort of reshaped America in many ways, and now this millennial generation is gonna sort of reshape America again. But the challenge for Monterey County is that you have had trouble retaining this demographic. So if you want the young uh, Cal State Monterey Bay students to stay here, to uh, begin to, again, grow uh, a new economy here, you have to think about what are the amenities that these young people are looking for. And as Tim pointed out, these kids are much less inclined to own a car. Uh, they're much more inclined to bike, and they want to live in places that have transit. Uh, and finally, um, uh, again, half of all households are single people. Uh, women are an important part of the workforce now, and a lot of women uh, want to buy a house, but they don't want to buy a house that has the maintenance requirements of a single family home in a suburban area. They'd rather live in an attached unit. So these are all important demographic trends. The other thing is that transit-oriented development is only clustering in certain types of locations. So when you do your plans, you don't want to think that because there's empty land someplace, it means there's going to be development there. What we found is that, uh, and this data are taken from Charlotte, North Carolina, that uh, uh, where we had 10% of the total land area uh, when they built a new transit line, they got 68% of the new development. And in lower density residential neighborhoods where they had 30% of the land area, they only got 8% of the new development. So again, this compact development clusters and like follows like. So these kinds of uh, denser, denser developments uh, want to be together. The other thing is that we are expanding our thinking about transit. And again, this is building on Tim's theme. Um, we used to think that transit was only a rail-based thing. This is the light rail from uh, Phoenix. Uh, but what we're seeing is that more and more regions are realizing that bus is a viable alternative. This is from Lane County, Oregon. This is bus rapid transit. But these bike trails, uh, urban bikeways, cycle tracks are actually becoming also a viable form of transit or transportation. Uh, and uh, they're two wheels. So we're going from rail to four wheels to two wheels. And then, interestingly enough, we're looking at other kinds of transportation providers as becoming partners with our transit uh, uh, authorities. So in Denver, they've created this Success Express, which is actually a school bus system, but it's moving kids around a whole region of uh, North Denver 
and linking up all the schools in that region. And it would be an easy stretch to see that bus then continuing on to a light rail stop. And people are beginning to talk about that. So uh, again, these are interesting conversations about ways to solve sort of multiple challenges with different modes of transportation. Now, what we're also seeing is that all these different transportation systems have economic benefits. And if I had known about Tim's website, I would have gone there and pulled some of his numbers down. But uh, I did f uh, find a study from a few years ago, and this is from bike sharing in Minneapolis, where uh, in their first year of that system being in operation, uh, they found that they had about $150,000 in additional rider expenditures that they were seeing for uh, businesses that were right near a bike share mode, a little, a little uh, pod of bikes, right? So what these businesses were finding was that if someone was dropping off a bike, then they were more likely to come in and also buy a cup of coffee. And for a lot of small businesses, this could be the difference between a break-even and a profitable year. And in a region like this, where your big scale retail is already pretty well built out, but you might you want to think about how to add more kind of local, local serving retail, thinking about how to bring the consumers to the store is an important uh, thing to consider. And so this bike share piece is really important. Now, my, I see my picture of the Indianapolis Cultural Arts Trail dropped out from here. My apologies for that. But you've seen pictures of it already in this presentation. Let's see if I go back one. This is it. This is from Indianapolis. OK, not a region known for really progressive stuff. And they don't have any uh, fixed guideway transit there, even though they are a pretty big uh, metropolitan region. But they've built this cultural arts trail, which is a beautiful separated biking and walking trail. And it connects up uh, eight or nine uh, in neighborhoods through Indianapolis. And they feel that there's been as much as $846 million in economic impact impact from having this trail. So that economic impact is uh, distributed across the whole economy. It's not just for the local retailers, but it's all kinds of expenditures that are now rippling through the economy that weren't there before. And finally, this, uh, again, rubber tire based, you know, people say, oh, if we don't have rail, we aren't going to have these impacts. Uh, but actually, our experience from bus rapid transit is also showing in Pittsburgh and Lane County, Oregon, that we can see as much as a $9,000 increase in the value of a single family home uh, from being close to uh, bus rapid transit. And in Eugene, Oregon, that's Lane County, Oregon, they saw a huge amount of employment growth happening along the bus rapid transit line, where they saw employment decline across the entire region. So again, these are important attractors for economic activity. Oh, there's my picture. OK. Um, so uh, lesson five is that transit must be equitable and transit-oriented development. One of the more disturbing trends that we're seeing is that because a lot of transit-oriented development is going into uh, desirable neighborhoods or it's becoming, these neighborhoods are becoming desirable because of the transit connection, the price of housing goes up, right? It's supply and demand, right? If you have limited supply uh, and there's a lot of demand, then that drives the price up. And so what's happening is these low-income households who really can benefit the most from having access to transit are being pushed out to the more auto-oriented parts of the region, and they're bearing the brunt of uh, not being able to access transit. So uh, transit agencies uh, and other uh, organizations, including these metropolitan transportation organizations that fund transportation around the country, are creating all kinds of policies to address this inequity. And it's very important. MARTA is the big uh, transit system in uh, Atlanta. And they have set a policy goal that for any development that happens in this really ugly parking lot that you see here is a development site for MARTA. They're going to build a big housing project there. And and they're requiring that 20% of those units are affordable. So uh, we can no longer require uh, any housing development uh, that is a rental project to include a certain number of affordable units that's illegal in California. But if a private property owner or a public agency like MARTA has a policy like this, then when they negotiate a deal with an individual developer, they can require that those units be provided. So this is really essential. This kind of idea of equity is essential. 
We also have a lot of challenges for implementing TOD, and uh, Peter Katz teases me about always being the downer. <laughs> He's gonna lift you up and be very visionary at the end. But I also am very pragmatic, and I feel like if we don't talk about these things, if we don't bring these things up, then we, we won't be uh, kind of helping ourselves move forward. Uh, and this is also a good thing to know as you go into the planning charrette in a couple of weeks, uh, is what are some of the things that we want to be sure to address as we think about the regional trails. So one thing that we see is that transit alone does not make a real estate market. And if you have a place that's not that desirable uh, from a real estate perspective, adding transit is not necessarily going to transform that place over overnight. So. Uh, uh, this is from Atlanta, again, from um, a, a neighborhood called Cabbage Town, which I think is really so charming. Cabbage Town reminds me of Cabbage Patch. Anyway, uh, you see this tiny little house. It actually reminds me of the uh, little tiny bungalows in Pacific Grove that a friend of mine once said went way off the cute meter. But they're tiny, right? And at some point, no one would ever have thought about living in a house that small. But the thing about these houses in Cabbage Town is that they're really close to a new uh, emerging transit line, and suddenly everybody wants to live there. Uh, so these places have become very popular. On the other hand, this is the Sacramento region. Sorry about the um, uh, sort of elongation of this map. But all these red areas have transit lines. These numbers are actually numbered transit stations. And transit has n done nothing to revitalize this neighborhood. So this is something that we have to keep in mind, that transit is not a silver bullet for uh, community re revitalization. Or um, the other thing is that transit planning, uh, and I think this is true of a lot of planning, can become too focused on, a, on vision without taking into consideration market conditions or uh, current community issues. So uh, these pictures come from Baltimore, but again, these, these uh, uh, lessons are transferable. So uh, in Baltimore, they did this big vision for what they were going to do along this new light rail. You see all this cool development they're planning for. Uh, but once they drew these uh, pictures, they had no idea how to get here, and they had no idea what first steps they could take to be sure that the people who already lived here could stay here. Uh, and so there are a lot of steps that they could take just to improve conditions for the existing neighbors. And by the way, if the existing neighborhood looks better and people are functioning better, then people will be more likely to invest. So thinking incrementally, so starting with the big vision, but then also having the big vision is critical. I am not against visioning. I actually think it's essential. But I also think that we also have to say, OK, once we have our vision, what are we going to do on Monday morning when we go back to the office from the charrette? Uh, and then uh, one of my key points is that regions that continue to let jobs sprawl away from transit are always going to have a problem. And this is my poster child for this. This is Phoenix. Uh, here's their light rail system, their one line that they've built so far. It's pretty cool. It's getting cooler. Who knew Phoenix was cool? Uh, but it actually is getting to be pretty good, even though it's hot when you go there. But anyway, but what, what Phoenix did, sorry, uh, uh, at the same time that they built this light rail line, they also built this belt line, this uh, uh, ring road, right? and all their employment growth has sprawled out. So while downtown is struggling to retain businesses, uh, they're having all their employment growth is along the edge. So this idea of keeping development compact and really keeping your employment destinations in the mix when you think about planning for these systems, and again, that can be transit, that can be these bike lanes, whatever, is essential. Because if you don't have the jobs in there, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and finally, this gets to this question about implementation of infrastructure. And I can really go on for hours about infrastructure financing, so be careful if you ask me questions about this. Um, but we have a heavy reliance on what we call value capture tools. Uh, that's what uh, the FORA uses through its community benefit district and so forth and so on. You have to have the new development in order to get the uh, transformation that you want on the sort of public side. And I'm suggesting that we need to think about how to decouple those things and how to look at where to get sources of development uh, early on. And this is where the federal government is so important and this conversation about shifting 
shifting federal priorities so that we're not just putting all our transportation dollars into roads, but we're also thinking about the spectrum of uh, transportation investments. Uh, and we can talk more about that in questions and answers. So I'm going to wrap up. I hope I'm doing OK, time-wise, OK. Um, so the big point that I want to make here is that transit is the connector, right? It's really just the artery through which things flow. And smart growth are the dots that we're trying to connect up. So these are our nodes of compact, walkable places that give people choice. They're not all the same. Some of them can be jobs. Some of them can be housing. Um, and that transit can be more than one mo mode. Again, bikes and walking can be connectors as well. So next, successful transit has to have concentrated development, but not necessarily high density. And I think this is uh, the point I was trying to make in showing you that uh, Denver transit line, single family housing can be fine. Uh, it needs to be uh, maybe not uh, one per acre, but um, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, big apartment buildings either. As I said, employment centers and institutions are key, and what I mean in, by institutions is Cal State, Monterey Bay is an institution, focus the uh, activity at each dot, and this is particularly important for this region because you're growing very slowly. And whether or not you build some of the projects that are kind of in the pipeline, uh, it's still going to be a slow uh, slog, in a way, to get back to where you were when uh, Ford Ord was at its heyday. Uh, and so you have to think about all that growth as sort of precious drops of water that you want to conserve, that you don't want to just fling out into the uh, atmosphere. And finally, uh, look for funding and financing strategies to ha help catalyze rather than penalize development. And again, we can talk about that more in the question and answer. And so I'll just conclude with this final slide. The transit is only a means to an end. Connecting the dots is really the goal, and that's really where the value is created. So thank you very much. OK, so here's the first question. Salinas is experiencing a large push for outward growth to accommodate potential large ag tech manufacturing employment. What incentives or policies are you aware of that encourages or guides these sort of employers into more central transportation friendly uh, locations? Well, land use policy is probably the biggest uh, uh, disincentive uh, where you don't zone land for uh, industrial activity if you don't want industrial activity to go to those locations. And uh, I was in Spokane, Washington a few years back, and the uh, county economic development person was talking about the fact that if they add a new employer out in the county, <clears throat> then their metrics look good because they've added jobs. But for everybody else in the county, that just adds cost. Because the transit agency then has to serve it, the water district has to serve it, the, um, uh, if there's housing out there, then the school district has to serve it. So I think the other uh, way to think about this is to do the math and see what the fiscal cost or the fiscal impact of this kind of expansion is and see what the trade-off is. And then the other thing is to really work to prepare land that's in the, already in the city to be sure that it's available. So does it have the right zoning? Uh, do you have the right uh, infrastructure in place, including roads, sewer, water, et cetera? So on the one hand, it's disincenting for the wrong location and ensuring that you have the right policies to ensure the, for the right location. Okay, how do businesses benefit from employees using public transit? Uh, how do these businesses respond to public transit schedules that require modified work start and end times? That's a great question. Um, a lot of businesses are finding that public transit is extremely helpful to them because uh, it gives greater reliability for their workers. Uh, and sometimes if people can't afford gas, they can't get to work. Uh, it's a problem, and uh, I was in um, Kelso, Washington in the fall, which is a small 30,000 person town, and they have a Foster Farms chicken processing plant there, and getting their employees to work is a huge problem for them because people can't all drive. So uh, have cutting down on the cost of uh, worker training, uh, having better um, uh, attendance is a big money maker for the businesses. It goes right to their bottom line. Now, uh, working with transit agencies is essential, uh, and uh, the, the relationship between shifts 
uh, and transit schedules is really important. And again, in Spokane, this was a very active conversation between the transit provider and the airport there. So I think this is just something that's an ongoing conversation back and forth. Okay, given the Baltimore example, would redevelopment be more effective locally by focusing on transportation of blighted areas first and then new development later? Yes, <laughs> that's probably true. Now in this, uh, in the Fort Ord context, redevelopment is extremely challenging because of having to take down all these buildings. Uh, and uh, I d unfortunately, I don't have the answer for that. <laughs> but um, I think that, that w you already have the infrastructure otherwise in place. Uh, so that would be ideal. But we can't always have what's ideal, so we have to sometimes compromise. And I think that the idea of trying to focus growth and development and then spend money for blight removal in the places we're trying to focus growth first is probably the first thing. I'm sure you've already thought of that. That's sort of a duh. But again, that continuing to focus all kinds of investments in the same place so that we're um, not doing one thing over here and another thing over here, but we've got everything right here is the most important way to think about this. Okay, a few years ago, local officials debated whether to plan a rail line or bus rapid transit on an old rail easement along the coast. Most of uh, them thought BRT would have stigma of bus and rail, and rail was more attractive to people, do you agree? It would serve a major commute function, transit uh, tourists secondarily. And this is the same music thing too. Similar. Okay, people's image of public transit is somehow less than and only for the poor, uh, those without cars, the old, the disabled, in fact, uh, just not us. What is the uh, marketing strategy to change that? Well, uh, there are a lot of different strategies for dealing with this. One is making the buses look cool. Uh, and in Kansas City, they've done this. The other is making the bus stops really functional. Uh, so in Kansas City, they have built a bus rapid transit line where every stop is covered, it's sheltered, it gets really cold in Kansas City, in case you haven't been there. Uh, they all have next bus electronic signage in them so you know when the next bus is coming. Uh, and the buses are easy to get onto and off of. So they, again, this is what I said earlier about comfortable transportation. Uh, there's a great story from Boulder about the, for students, uh, letting students drive the buses and then they could pick their own music. So if you knew that you were a deadhead and the, you, the deadhead driver, you could get in that group, you know. So people did that. So they called that bus the hop and the hop was so successful that then they created the skip and then they had the jump and now everybody rides those things. It's not just students, but uh, it's really fun. The other thing is putting bike racks. I know I have the picture of the bike racks on the MST buses, but that kind of thing. I know MST has done a program educating seniors about how to ride a bus. A lot of people who have grow, grown up and, and lived most of their adult lives in places that didn't have adequate bus service may perceive buses as uh, unwelcoming because they just don't know how to use them. Uh, and so this idea of really marketing to people, teaching people how to use, uh, the, uh, this is another reason people give transit passes to high school students uh, and kids who can't drive is that once you're a transit rider as a young person, then you're much more likely to be a transit rider as an adult and it won't be uncomfortable to you as a senior. Okay, what minimum density is needed for a successful transit line? Oh, that's a surprising question. Uh, well, you know, there, actually there's kind of a lively debate about this um, and uh, what, what I've been able to glean from this debate, and I, I've looked at this literature actually very recently, is that it's by people per acre, it's not by units per acre, uh, and that you want to get around 30 people per acre. So if you think two people per house, that's about 15 units potentially. Uh, so, and that's, by the way, that's a townhouse configuration. Uh, you could maybe get it down a little bit to maybe 12 units per acre. You could get single family attached with that. So it's not, again, it, it's not uh, big apartment complexes. It can be pretty low, but you can, that density works if you've got the employment at the other end. Okay. Uh, let's see, if there's, oh, rather than build, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can we get local cities to, this is, 
to refurbish old areas rather than build open space? Is it cheaper to build? When is it cheaper to build on prime, pristine land? How can land? you get people to develop established areas when it is already cheaper, cheaper to, build? to build? Okay, yeah, okay. So how do, yeah, infill is expensive. This is a problem. Uh, and so again, this is where we have to create some disincentives for people to build where it's cheap. Uh, and then we have to be sure that we have all the right incentives in place uh, so that people build where we want them to. Uh, so that involves having the right zoning. Uh, it, sometimes creating some of these amenities like having transit, having bike facilities, all these things make units more valuable. Uh, and they make the location more desirable. So uh, sometimes having, providing the right public amenities uh, is enough to get people to say, hey, I want to be there. Uh, and remember that little tiny house I showed, that Cabbage Town house? I mean, you know, who would think that you would raise a family in a house that small, right? But if that house, I, I live in a house with one bathroom, I raise two kids in a house with one bathroom, and a lot of people think I'm crazy, but that house is right across the street from the elementary school. It's three blocks from my office. It's a block from a grocery store. It was a great way to grow up for my kids. And now they're super independent and autonomous and they never boomeranged home, okay? <laughs> so think about, think about that. Just saying. So, uh, uh, so I think that these are important things to think about is it's not all about the house, uh, but it's really about the amenities that people look for. And so I think instead of thinking about building catalytic buildings, it's really about building catalytic infrastructure and creating lifestyle value that way. Dina, thank you very much. Thank you.